What's up everyone? So in the last few videos, we finished the IS curve. We showed how uh, total spending and interest rates are negatively related. We showed how fiscal policy can influence that total spending and the IS curve. So now we need to try to build in the money supply into this somehow. To do that, we're gonna use this theory of liquidity preference and the LM curve. So again, all, this entire theory comes from John Maynard Keynes and his writings right around the Great Depression and basically trying to describe ways that we can counteract these short run fluctuations with different policies. And so this theory of liquidity preference basically just says that the interest rate can be determined by the interaction of money supply and money demand. It's very similar to the model we had, I believe in chapter four, that money supply and money demand are gonna be really important for the determination of the price of money, which is essentially the interest rate. In this model, we'll have the supply of real money balances be fixed. It's a policy variable that the Fed can change real money balances. And the demand for real money balances is based on the price of money, the interest rate, how costly it is to hold money over time. And so if we're going to graph any of this, we can graph the money supply as just uh, this fixed amount of real money balances. So if the interest rate is on the y-axis and real money balances are on the x-axis, the Fed essentially has complete control over the money supply. That's going to happen at m bar over p bar. And so the supply of real money balances has to be fixed in this model. Basically, the Fed can control the total amount of money supply, M, and we've assumed throughout this ISLM model that prices are fixed in the short run. And so M bar over P bar is going to be our money supply. The money supply is not at all dependent on the interest rate. It's just something the Fed can manipulate over time. Now on the other side of that, money demand is going to depend on the interest rate. As it becomes costlier for people to hold money, they're going to try to hold less money. They're going to hold instead some kind of asset that's going to bear interest. If interest rates are really high, you're going to try to take advantage of that rate of return. And so we're going to have basically the same money demand curve that we had in chapter four. it's just a downward sloping liquidity function that's a function of the interest rate. And so when it's really expensive to hold money, when interest rates are really high, we're going to hold less money. Our real money balances are going to decline. When it's really, really cheap to hold money, when interest rates are really low, everybody's going to hold a lot of money and real money balances are going to be very high. And so the demand for real money balances is just going to be M over P. And again, this is a demand curve. This is not necessarily M over P to the D. It's just real money balance demand is a liquidity function of the interest rate. It's just like that model we had in chapter five. So we have this downward sloping demand curve for real money balances. And so we can take this and combine it into this comprehensive theory for how interest rates are determined using the money supply. Basically, we're just gonna put on that money supply curve to the same graph. And so this is going to determine 
that fixed amount of money supply is going to determine our equilibrium real interest rate. And so the intersection between our money demand and our money supply determines our interest rate R. And so the Fed can change the money supply. The Fed has complete control over the total amount of money in the economy. They can increase and decrease the money supply in an effort to change the real interest rate. And so you've seen this a lot lately where the Fed has tried to increase and decrease interest rates. Really all they're trying to do is change the money supply. And so hypothetically, let's say that the Fed wanted to raise the interest rate. The Fed's been decreasing interest rates a lot recently, but we can look at how the Fed will raise the interest rate. So how the Fed raises rates. So if we initially start at this money supply MS1, at M1 over P, if the Fed wants to increase the interest rate, they're going to decrease the amount of money in the economy. So we're initially at this interest rate R1, and if they decrease the amount of money in the economy, they decrease this entire fraction and they shift the money supply to the left. So we go from MS1 to MS2. And when we go from MS1 to MS2, we go up the liquidity curve. We go up that money demand curve to the equi new equilibrium interest rate, R2. And so to keep this straight, a fall in the money supply, like we saw here, has to cause the interest rate to increase. It basically raises the price of money. And so if you think back, we had this historical episode in the 1970s where inflation was really, really high, right? Inflation was really, really high and so Jimmy Carter appointed the Paul Volcker to the Federal Reserve. Paul Volcker came in and said that his one goal was to decrease inflation. He said he was going to do that by decreasing the amount of real money balances in the economy. He was going to slow the growth rate of the money supply. So between 1979 and 1980, the Fed reduced real money balances, M over P, by 8%. And when they did that, inflation went down really significantly. It was about 11 or 12%, like we've talked about. And by 1983, it was below 4%. Inflation fell drastically. And so we can see how this plays with the theory of flexible prices that we've had up to this point. And so with this theory of liquidity preference, we have that prices are sticky. And so when the money supply decreases, it should raise the nominal interest rate. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw that when the Fed cut the money supply, Interest rates went from about 10% in 1979 to over 15% about six months later in 1980. But over time, as inflation came down, because of that Fisher equation, which says the nominal interest rate is the real interest rate plus inflation, when inflation decreased, that naturally decreased nominal interest rates. So as, pr as prices became more flexible, our prediction was that the nominal interest rate would fall. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw that the nominal interest rate in 1979 was 10%. By 1980, it was 16%. But by 1983, when inflation had fallen really significantly, the nominal interest rate had fallen as well. The nominal interest rate was down below 10% to about 8%. And so it looks like the Fed was able to control the money supply. The Fed was able to control the money supply, and that controlled interest rates. And by controlling interest rates, 
they were able to control inflation in this episode in the 1980s. 